uh, usually stall myself out for this kind of event. I can stop and talking about something that's not fit for the future of my life. Which is that uh, I really need to turn this down a little bit. Maybe I'll walk over here. Uh, as you know, uh, we are around very beautiful mountains, which is one of the reasons why I'm wearing this t-shirt. And, um, and it has something to do with this particular series of lectures. One of these, it says, this is advice from a mountain. And one of them says, patience, patience, patience. <laughs> and then it says, get to the point and enjoy the view. So the idea is that I've been trying to philosophy that I've been trying to use is to give you a fly over the mountains, okay? And from some of the questions that were asked last time, uh, it's clear that if you really want to go down to the level and look at every flower and insect and so on, that you need to take time away from these lectures to do so. So while you're flying with an airplane, try not to jump out of it and say, oh, that's a nice flower, let's go look at it. Okay, <clears throat> but uh, please do ask questions that, uh, that I can clarify and I'll try to remember that if you start to ask me about uh, some of the details I would say, um, come afterwards and I'll be happy to talk to you. Okay, uh, so we are on the third section, which is uh, in one dimension. I'll remind you of where we were yes, last time. It's that we did the uh, two-dimensional system to take the other model and drive it a little bit. And as long as you're above or near to see, uh, we're in reasonably good shape. We have an idea of what's going on, but once you go below to see, all hell starts to break loose. Um, so the question is whether you can gain some insight by saying, well, if I can't solve this model, maybe I can follow this thing and go down in one dimension. And uh, even more than that is to, at one point or another, you can turn off the interaction completely not go down in one dimension and turn it off completely. That's what I mean by bare bones. So when you turn off the interaction completely, the guy can still jump backwards. That's what this uh, finite amount of P is meaning. And that we have made is called the as 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 asymmetric symbol exclusion process. Uh, now you can go even one more thing to make it even simpler is to take equals infinity. That just means the guy only jumps one way and he never jumps backwards, okay? And so this is called the totally asymmetric simple exclusion process. And it's often referred to as contact. And in all your notes, you see contact coming up all over the place. And uh, this uh, mathematician has started this game back some time ago. <coughs> So, what is concept? Well, for periodic boundary conditions, we start as trivial, and for um, open boundary conditions, um, the uh, P star is more trivial, and the dynamics is even more exciting and so on and so forth. So, the thing that we wanted to do uh, a little bit today, I hope we'll get, get time to do, is to talk about extensions that is good for modeling protein synthesis. Okay. So, uh, to give you a little bit of outline of today's what I hope to cover is that I'll give you a brief uh, glimpse of the history of the early process. One is a toy for field mathematics. Uh, field mathematics, as you we like to say, is a mathematician. Brent, are you here? If Brent is here, I hope you'll forgive me to say that mathematicians praise only with toys. <laughs> and uh, chemists, on the other hand, is trying to do something else and that is to look at protein synthesis. This is, this, on the other hand, my interest in other types of things which I'll try to talk about. And then, in particular, um, we try to get a little bit away from just pure physics and try to get to something that is a little bit more real, <coughs> very far from protein synthesis, and I will uh, go through these uh, a little bit a little bit. So, uh, let me start off with a brief glimpse of what happened in 1970. So the idea is that you have five holes on an one-dimensional axis, <coughs> literally now, no interactions whatsoever. The guys are not allowed to step backwards. That's the zero, and that's the totally asymmetric part. They're not allowed to step on each other. So that's the uh, simple exclusion part. And otherwise, if you're to really have a ground condition, you can just step back. You can also have open, which means that whenever this sign is empty, you can come in. Whenever there's a particle out there, it can go out. And alpha and beta are the different rates that you can have these things occur. And all of you would immediately occur that who cares what the thing called gamma is, you might as well set it equal to one, and then you do whatever that is needed to be done. <coughs> okay? Now, this is uh, such a simple model that indeed most of the intuition that you built would not be so badly off, but nevertheless, 
if you consider certain things, you would see surprises, okay? And that's what we're going to try to talk about. Now, um, as far as the configurations are concerned, if you really want to write down Masters equation and what have you, you would start off with just the occupation of the various sites, one through L and so on, and then off to go. <coughs> so, the question for the mathematical, mathematical in, uh, community is, what is the stationary distribution? And what can we say at all about time dependence? And if we do get a hold of these things, what, can things, what are the things that we can compute that is of interest? So is that simple enough? Yes? Good. All right, now, as far as the biochemists are concerned, working independently at about the same time are these people at uh, Brown, and uh, it turns into a PhD thesis and so on. Then what they're interested in is something that I would, uh, is motivated by biology. Now, how many of people here has never heard of the central dogma of biology? One, two, three. Okay, I can jump. <laughs> here we go. So, this is, the, this is the quick version of the central dogma, which is that whatever you are using for your body, like you are growing, like, to make your hair, your eyes, whatever it is, sitting in your blue paper with DNA, and every now and then a polymer race comes along, unzips it in the middle, and then try to make a copy, which is this blue thing, and that's called a messenger RNA. And what this messenger RNA contains is, of course, a lot of codes as to what to do. What we do is that um, eventually what you want to do is take up this polypeptide chain that is your protein, and that protein is the thing that you use for whatever you, you need. And how does this code change into that protein is by taking the ribosome, which uh, comes in on the uh, beginning of this thing, walks to the other end, and as it walks, it reads the code, and then knits the appropriate uh, amino acid fellow to go along, and eventually you would get this protein, and that's, uh, or rather this chain, and this chain we fold in a particular way in order to um, give you the protein that would do whatever that needs to be done. So the process that we're interested in is the process of translation, the set, this little piece of the whole story. And as I say, a ribosome starts at one end, and that's called initiation in biology. It walks to the other end, um, knitting, I think of knitting of this chain, and it's called elongation. And then at the end, it just takes off and releases the um, polypeptide chain, and that's ready to do whatever it needs to do for you. But typically, before one falls off, another one starts, and here's a nice little picture that, um, let's see if I can this off a bit, huh? Um, <clears throat> there's a nice little picture that uh, somebody took a piece of uh, mRNA, stretched it to the site chain, and actually see the various ribosomes and the various bits of proteins that uh, is partially or partially completed proteins. So they come out of one end, takes off, and goes out the other end. So that ought to remind you of this other process that I've been talking about, which uh, that, that's what this, uh, this motivation behind this story is. So what are they interested in? Well, they're obviously interested in how fast these uh, proteins are being produced, because if you assume that the proteins degrade once they're being produced by, uh, at a somewhat constant rate, then it's related to how much of this protein you have in your body. So the question is, how many hemoglobins do you have? You know, when you, work, when you go up to high elevation, maybe your body says, oh my god, I need to produce more of these things, and it says, uh, produce more. So this protein level is what is important for you. And as far as we are concerned, of course, that is associated with the current in the steady state of the public. And eventually, you might want to say, can we say anything about how many of these guys are sitting there, and how many, are, and where are they sitting, and so on, and biologists are not interested in this very much, but we think they may be of interest to the idea of competition, which I'll come back to later. Full dynamics is far, far down the priority list, and not much is needed to say no about what is going on in that case. So, with that little introduction, let me get back to the physicists of Tatis. So, we are interested in silly things like phase transition. In particular, do phase transitions occur in one dimension, and what are the density profiles, whether there is anomalous diffusion, and whether we can find out exact solutions, and so on and so forth. Okay? So the question is again the same one, what is the full dynamics, and what is the stationary distribution? 
For the ring, it turns out the dance it was uh, given a long time ago, and it's also very easy. It's so easy that I can tell you how to get this. But now, instead of detail balance, which would give you one, it is pairwise detail balance. So you remember detail balance is, tells you that going from here to here is the same as going from here to here, and you can balance these two things. But instead of doing that, this is not a particle, this is a configuration. So instead of balancing pairwise, uh, uh, I'm sorry, two, two guys like this, you say that one will never come back. That's the idea of pattern, it never comes back. However, if there is somebody else that comes in at just the right amount so that whatever comes in this way goes out that way. Okay? That's pairwise detail balance. And it's very easy to understand how that comes about. Suppose I take any particular configuration I want, uh, let's say with three particles here and have some holes here and some more particles there, I don't care, whatever you want. What is bad about the ordinary detail balance is that we know very well that this jump is allowed in rate one, and that jump, in other words, to here, to go from here to here is rate one, to go from here to here is rate zero. Okay, so you never count. However, what you want to notice is that somebody else can come here with rate one, and we balance it out in the following sense, which is that whoever is the last guy that has a hole behind it, look at that configuration. Look at this configuration, and you can see that this guy jumps into here with rate one. So this goes here with rate one, and this goes here with rate one, and you can pairwise balance them by saying if this probability, this occurs with probability one, this is with one, this is one, and whatever current that comes in here goes out there, and you're stuck. So that's pairwise detail balance. It's a very strange <coughs> word, but never mind, that's what it's used in the literature. So the dynamics, however, is highly non-trivial. Yes? Are there three configurations now for the balance? That's right, that's right. The pairwise detail balance requires three configurations. The ordinary detail balance is to say uh, WP is equal to WP, right? And this is C to C prime, and this is C prime to C. That's the ordinary detail balance. So you jump out and you jump back in. So this one is one, and that one is zero, and you're never going to do this, right? There's no way you can do this. So what happens is that you apply a third configuration that jumps in with red one. Is that clear? Uh, excuse me. Sorry, yeah. so alpha and beta is the same for each of them? For entering particle and entering particle? No, this is the ring. There's no alpha and beta. Oh, oh. This is only the ring. Uh, non-trivial dynamics. So you say, gee, this thing shouldn't have anything interesting. Apart from the fact that you have non-trivial dynamics, I should just uh, make it, um, a side remark. Depending on what your questions are so a statistical system, there are all kinds of non-trivial results, even for the equilibrium rising level and non-interaction. Yes, I do mean to the end configurations, all of them with equal probability. You can ask questions so that you can't easily answer them. Okay? That's just an aside. So let's turn to the open case. Now suddenly this guy is so non-trivial that Mr. Schmidt couldn't solve it, and it wasn't solved until 1992, very recent that dynamics is even more interesting. So for this lecture, we'll focus mainly on this case, as only a tiny corner of this case. We can have a whole summer school on class like 54. That's how big that system is. So now we come back to your issue. We have alpha and beta, and we want to ask, what happens in this space diagram when I start changing things? Uh, I can go beyond one too, but never mind. Let me remind you, in one dimension, with short-range interactions and short-range dynamics, there are no transitions. It's one of the things I hope you have learned, at least in the long-range order, in, in, in statistical mechanics. So, suddenly, for a one-dimensional model with bare bones, no interactions, no nothing, there is a phase, there are phase diagram, non-trivial phase diagram. There are three phases in fact. What is it called? Max term, high and low density. Now, this space diagram should not surprise you because you run into this problem every day, assuming you have a car. Which is that you're driving along a road and there's a traffic light, and then there's another traffic light at the other end of the road. And if this traffic light is very slow and that traffic light is very fast, what happens? You get a jam. 
If this one is very fast and this one is slow, there's hardly anything. That's otherwise known as the high density and low density phase. Right? If the two traffic lights are both very fast, boom, everybody goes, and that's called a max current phase. So, at least we're not surprised by this kind of result. So, what is surprising is that the max current phase is critical in some sense. When you start to go in there and ask questions, you suddenly see power laws all over the place, non-trivial powers, okay, that you would not expect and so on. This is a, is a lecture all by itself. I'm not going to talk about that in detail. So the density for these high and low densities are easy to understand. The density of the high density phase is controlled by the outgoing traffic light. If the outgoing traffic light is very slow, then the density is going to jam up. It's going to be over half. The low density one is also easy. It's controlled by the incoming one. And then you have that situation. OK. Uh, this row here is nothing but taking the occupation numbers, if you have them, and summing over them and dividing by L. How do you define alpha and beta? Alpha and beta is the rate at which you allow guys to come in at the beginning. So now we're talking about open system. So if you have an empty hole, you inject a particle in here with rate alpha. Okay, and beta is the other end. Where if you have a particle here, you take it out as rate beta. Does it help? Oh, okay. So Can you look for the definition of row again? Row is the, um, row is the, um, you take the occupation numbers. I don't know why it's not coming up. Oh, maybe it's on the previous slide. Uh, you take the uh, occupation numbers, you sum of all possible ones, and you divide by L. This is not on the slide. This is not on the slide. So, sorry about that. Um, so you take the occupation of each site, you take the average, okay, and you sum over them and you divide by L. So just how many particles are in the system on the average? That's it. Okay. Eventually I will talk about profiles. There will be rows of I, and there is just nothing but interval. How often is the site occupied? So eventually I will talk about that. Yes. When you say row equals a half, um, is that everywhere in the mass current phase or just this? Oh, this is in the thermodynamic limit, sorry. There's a profile that is coming. And you said that square? In the yeah, phase. that's correct. That's correct. So that's one of the things, things which is uh, a little bit unusual. You're not used to seeing a phase diagram in which criticality is whole region rather than just one point. But that's kind of, you know, semantics, if you like. Take the two-dimensional lining order with J power of J for you have a whole line of critical lines. So, that's the sort of situation. Any other questions? You said you have some situation in the system. Correct. For the time of time, what is the difference in the system? If you have to work out a transformation, you can change the alpha, not the alpha, but the alpha, but the alpha, but the alpha, but the alpha. That's right, that's right. That's what this is. And this symmetry that you see here is the underlying particle symmetry. If you exchange alpha and beta, it, you can see that beta is really nothing but the rate in which you inject holes into the system. And what happens is that hole, one goes through this way, and hole comes back. Okay? So this symmetry is certainly there. I will write the whole density as 1 minus rho in this particular situation. What is more interesting is that you have these different phases. This is critical and this is not critical in the sense that they are algebraic, uh, decays and things like that. And this one is exponential decays. The line that separates these is a continuous second, quote, second order phase transition. We don't have a free energy. We don't know who to sum over and so on. And so it's not clear what is meant by the usual order in the sense of derivative. Across this line is a discontinuous transition, and if you insist on sitting this line, you would get phase coexistence between the high and the low density regimes. And the thing that um, separates them is otherwise known as a shock, and that shock, or the shock in the phase of shock, is then sometimes leads to people using the terminology. It's not a phase, but use the terminology. The label this line is the shock phase. Okay? So what yes. point is your power level? Excuse me? What quantities show power law in the critical field? Oh, all kinds of things, like correlations, like uh, density and so on. 
okay? An anomalous class, diffusion, you know, all anomalous and so on. Okay, so it's literally something you have to do calculations about. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is the current, okay? There's a very simple relationship that yesterday I already mentioned briefly, is that in order for something to flow, you have to have a particle and you have to have a hole. Otherwise, nothing moves here and nothing moves here. You really need a particle and a hole. And the simplest way to think about it is just rho times rho h. It's rho times rho minus rho. It looks like completely into your life, but it turns out that this thing is exact. You calculate it from you know, the kosher, the most kosher way is exact. So I know how to plot this thing. It's right there. And here's the max current phase. Now you see why it's called max current. Okay, you can't go beyond one corner in this uh, diamond. And you know, you can also see why this is called a high current phase. Once okay. so you tune the alpha converters, you will start to go into this region. Okay? Alright, so let me tell you a little bit about profile. What does the profile look like? You can see that this is a max current phase in which the average is one half. There is a little bit of, uh, generally, there's a little bit of tail in front and a little bit of tail at the end. You can imagine that as the traffic uh, comes in onto the road, it builds up on the front, and as they are allowed to leave, they take off. That's also something you're familiar with. If you do mean field theory to figure out what this profile is, you would get a tangent. Literally, R is equal to tangent I, okay, divided by some powers of what have you. However, if you do the exact calculations, this doesn't hold anymore. And there are power law cases in the system and so on, which is a little bit more exciting. So the high and low density phase, the average is high and low here. There's a little bit of a tail at the beginning and the end, and at this other end, there are no tails at all. So that's the way that it uh, shows up. Here's the interesting thing about the shock phase. Remember I talked about the fact that you can have coexistence between the low and the high density phase? Mm -hmm. And you're also familiar with that. You drive along and everything is comfy dory and then bam, you hit this traffic jam. Okay. Here it is. And now what happens is that this shock here is actually uh, microscopic. It's already exaggerated here. It's typically on the order of what? It's a couple of plus to get into your shock phase. But more interestingly is that as because alpha and beta are the same, it really doesn't know where it wants to sit. And you've also experienced that the shock sometimes decreases and sometimes increases. And on the average, it wanders all over the place. And the average over time is the linear profile. Okay. Okay. So all of this is perfectly understandable in an intuitive way. Much, much, much more is known exactly. The star is known exactly. Some averages, some punctuations, some correlations, and all this dimension. All of these things are known exactly. The machinery that you need to do that is not trivial. Quantum chains, beta answers, matrix products. That would probably take up at least four lectures. Well, at least by experts, not me. But uh, these are the people, and those are the reviews that are put on the suggested reading list that you can chase down. There's a lot of hard work in which this beta ansatz allows you to get equations with which you can determine the full spectrum of the entire evolution matrix, which means that not only do you have the steady state, but you also have all the eigenvalues and all the time you have. Okay? So that's how far this machinery has taken since the 90s, in the last 20 years. Do you have a question? Okay. The exact solutions, however, have limitations. They are very specialized. It cannot be generalized even for small changes. Such as, what if there is a little gravel patch in the middle of the road, and you are going along here very happily, and suddenly you just slow down? What happens? Can't solve it. Okay. Moreover, if you don't do that, again, it's very specialized is that if you compute certain things, you can do it. But if you want to compute other things, even though it looks terribly simple, you can't do it. Or at least you can't do it exactly. So, I want to take the next little bit of time to talk about one of these uh, situations, one of these very simple quantities that you may want to ask. And then suddenly, we can't calculate it exactly anymore, and we have to rely on other methods, such as approximations, mean field theory, and so on and so forth. So, the natural question is, suppose you are sitting in 
on uh, one of these steady states, and you want to ask what is uh, the uh, total authentication. The average is known and the fluctuations are known, but what about this time dependence, NFT? So remember, I'm not asking about well, how it goes to, to the steady state. I'm saying in the steady state, what does this NFT do? In other words, I'm interested in correlations in time. Okay? So I'll show you what happens, especially for finite systems. So into the system, you may think about things in a different way. Why would you want to ask such a question? You know, it's not very natural. The motivations again come from biology. And then you just take one detour, and that is, if you are trying to use this mechanism to, to uh, model protein synthesis, then you say, my goodness, there are lots and lots of these mRNAs sitting in the cell. There are a finite pool of these ribosomes which are walking along. What happens when they come? They have to compete for the same resource. Do some of them win big and do some of them lose? To quantify this answer, we need to know what this function of time is. Right? Who wins and who loses? Do they trade? And what do they do? It turns out that when we start to ask this question, nobody knows what NFC is like for just one pattern. With or without finite resources. At least nobody has looked at it, as far as we can tell. And we are surprised, at least to us. Okay, so now I'm going to show you what these NFTs look like for the three different phases. Okay, I'm going to show you uh, the, high, the max current, the shock phase, and the low density phase. So they look like this. The max, the, the low, let's start with the low density. It just it says the average is low. And it's going to jiggle around, fluctuation. Okay. This one says the average is one half and has some fancier fluctuations because it's so called physical. This one is easy to understand. You just finished telling me this stupid thing is doing random walk. So there's a random walk, right? Okay. Um, now, random walk of the shop. Random walk of the shop. And when the shop goes down here, you have very small numbers. When the shop is big, you have large <coughs> numbers. So, um, here are the expectations. We expect this thing to be anomalous because of uh, the fact that it's quote critical, we expect this to be random one. And that's the one which is supposed to be boring Gaussian noise for the low density of things. It's a long critical <coughs> number. So, how do we analyze NFT? Well, I want to do power spectrum. I want to do Fourier transform it and square it. I think the average should be precise. What we have done is particularly is tend to name of the column steps, take measurements every 100, so you can have some other correlations, that means I have taken six measurements. I cut this very long series, remember I'm doing a steady state, so I just cut it into 100 samples and take a report. I can send a report to these guys and calculate them, average of 100 samples, and I have my eye and omega. So, the point is that what I've just described with you can be predicted from the exact solution. However, in principle, you need the entire spectrum. You need a very special linear combination of the eigenvectors, and you need to sum over all of these charts. And that is why we want to infect the computer to do it for us. So here we go. That's the uh, thing that you've seen before. And you notice these three colors are not the same as those three colors, because I'm going to ask you to participate again. Who goes with who? This is the long, long part of the same thing. Who goes with the gray guy? Those who know, don't say anything. Okay. Any, any, uh, what, what, what are we, what are we asking? This is the NFT. I fully transform it, I swear it, and I look at the average. So that's the power spectrum. So take this guy, take uh, 10 iron examples of this, Fourier transform each one, square it, and average. That's the power spectrum. Who does the group? Well, that's why I don't give you the notes for everything. Because if I give you the answer, then it's gone. Right? There's no surprise anymore. Okay. You would have thought, anyway, the wiggly one goes with the wiggly one, and then it goes with the other one, right? Now, you mm -hmm. see there's an expert over there, he's shaking his head. I'm not an expert on your scenes. But my intuition tells me that that's a, a bad idea. <laughs> my intuition tells me that the red curve goes with the straight line on the white line. Uh, this one? Yes. Very good. 
And what about the other two? Uh, the green line goes with the blue curve. Good. And the uh, black line goes with the red curve. Very good. Very good. You don't have to pay for your uh, intuition or anything. <laughs> <laughs> it would be fully refunded. <laughs> You didn't know that at the end it was going to be a test, and depending on the test, how much intuition we had. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so if I had a large line and so on, I would ask you to explain what the reasonings are. But here are the reasons. The shock curve is easy. I told you it was a random walk. Therefore, you can easily calculate it. And so that's the homework. That's your one over omega squared. The MC phase is a little bit harder because the funny power, we already knew it. I'm not going to tell you where the 5.3 comes from because that's yet another bit of long story. However, when we actually do the simulations, it is not quite one, it's not quite five thirds. What I've done is to take, instead of asking how does it behave with this, I can multiply the spectrum with omega to various powers and see where it goes back. Okay? So it's only multiplied by five thirds. And taking the data to be plotted, and you can see it's slightly rising. We plotted with 1.62, it was starting with both that. Is this a little different significant? We don't know whether it's just simulation problems or whether it, it is real, really there or not, and whether it's other kinds of fancy finite size effects. Anyway, it's an unknown issue at the moment. However, the thing that I want to talk about is since you already guessed it, that is the one that is wiggly that looks like Mark Ness monster, that was what we were most surprised by. So we're talking about this contrast, okay? This is a low density, non-trivial thing, and it looks like this. Boom, boom, boom. Not only that, we see that it is this, the plot in the inset, and the plot down here is a system with a thousand, alpha is 0.3 and beta is 0.7. Over here, uh, oh, and you look at the tail here, the, the tail is only at a minus three half, and then you look at the other one for different alphas and the same uh, relationship between alpha and beta just for the sake of convenience, but a much bigger system and it packs a lot more of these triggers into the system or into the, into the plot. It really looks like a less monster now. Worse than that is that this tail is over the square. Can you imagine such stupidly simple systems giving you such rich behavior? What is even more surprising is this is raw data. I didn't rescale it, I didn't do anything, we didn't do anything. Took 2000, took alpha to a point to many beta, beta to a point to many alphas, and that's the list. They all sit on top of each other. Isn't that nice? Okay, some understanding. Oscillations. Well, this one looks terrible, but it's actually generic. So it's very easy to understand. Then we give you a toy. Single particle, constant velocity, random entrances. We're not talking about fancy things like that. We just have a row. We make alpha so low that it goes in, and this car just walks to the other and takes off. What does n of t look like? It can't be simpler, right? n of t looks like zero for a while, then it goes up to one, then it goes back down to zero, goes up to one, goes down to zero, and so on. And if you can't really transform that, you shouldn't be here. <laughs> You take the derivatives, a bunch of delta functions, you put a transform that, that's very easy. The average is about the only thing that's a little bit difficult because it says the time and entrances, I don't care about random space approximation or what have you. You get that value, and when you plot it, it looks like this. Remember, this is the rock. By the way, you have done this in your freshman or sophomore lab. It's called single slit diffraction. <laughs> And the three transform a single flat interval. That's really what it is. All right, so this is easy. Oh, I should say, the, where these zeros occur is, of course, the integer values of this size of the system. How long does it take to go on to the other side of the thing? So, what happens if we all go beyond the toy? The effect of dispersion and diffusion, now that we have lots of particles, they run into each other, they don't move, and constant velocity starts to go into the maximum. Minimum, that's it. So if you want to be slightly more serious about it, you take a, um, a mean field equation and you take a naive continuum limit, a much, much simpler version of things that Christina is, uh, is, is talking about. You see here is just how often does the, uh, 
particle and type I change? Well, provided there is a hole, provided there is a particle before it, provided there is a hole in the game, provided there is a particle at that side, and provided there is a hole the next side, you will lose. That's it. That's the whole thing. And now you just make your naive replacement of an end into row, and you have now an equation that looks like this. We've seen that something like that before. Now I'm just going to expand it around some state, linearize this whole thing out of it, and now I just add a little bit of noise to the whole thing, and I can then calculate it. And this thing is nothing but diffusion with a little bias. That's all. It's linear, <coughs> you solve everything. You now can calculate Sir, N of T and something. Yes? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, this is the noise, which means that we're not looking at a deterministic equation, so that this density can change or not change, because what I do in simulation is I randomly pick a side and see where I can move it. So if it doesn't get picked, it doesn't move. And so Why is there a partial variance of Oh, because P is PDX. Sorry. That is PDQ. Oh, I'm sorry. The yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't realize what you asked me. Yeah, sorry. Um, this thing is uh, a linear equation. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. 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 The original equation is P of rho is equal to dilution to J. Right? So the noise has to be in the current. That's right. The noise is in the current. It's in, uh, as far as the simulation is concerned, you pick a particle and then you decide whether you can move it or not. And so the noise is associated with the link. Associated with the link. Good question. Thank you. <coughs> OK. So you can solve the whole thing and you can then you know, analyze uh, various things as you want. And I won't bore you with all the details, but that is theory and that is simulation. Isn't that nice? So the red is the simulations. There's the L, there's the alpha and beta. And the theory has exactly the same L as and the V that is picked. is the one that has, uh, this is not a fitting parameter. It's some kind of alpha, it's some kind of row, or blah, 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 blah. The D and the A is it turns out not the one that we could use from this line theory. Instead, we're going to make it much, much bigger than when you get our neutral theory, which is both of these things are all in one. So, why so large? We don't have an answer, and hopefully, uh, the other answer, a uh, graduate student will eventually figure out what is happening in Celsius. What is A? I'm sorry, A was the uh, coefficient <coughs> of the noise correlation. Sorry, I, I had cut lots of stuff. So these are tuning parameters and you just get it in a little bit? We played with those in order to get that tune on. If we didn't play with those, this thing would be 500 down, it would be down here, the tune on would be down here. And then it would wiggle on much, much more because the team is quite a bit small. Um, incidentally, that little um, sort of vague hook calculation I showed you before is uh, a little bit handwriting. And what we've done now is to put it on a much more strong footing, and the same thing happens. So, um, relatively pushing. Any other questions? Okay. So let's go to the next part. So I, what I've done for you is to tell you a little bit about what type of history is, what, what we are interested in, and so on. And now let's try to make some extensions. Yeah. Okay. So can you give us the to the findings we just? Yeah. And can you explain why the scale numbers are different? So why it's flat on the top and then go back to the slides? You mean the pro this one? No. The no. proton, you mean? The, so when you plot the log of the power spectrum for the zero occupation? Yeah. Uh, for the... Low density phase. Oh, the no, for the high oh, density phase. The high density phase. You have the... No, not, not the, the high density. This one? Yeah, the pink curve. The pink curve. This one? Yes. Okay, this one is associated with that. Yeah. And it's parallel. Right, it's parallel. Why, why is it... Open over. Yeah, why does it then move over? Oh, that's, the, uh, that's, that's part of the minor science effects. If you take one bigger, bigger systems, it goes further, it goes over. Oh, okay, so that's the science effects. Right, minor science effects. Okay. 
Any other questions? I'll start asking you to put these slides. Uh, I guess I'm going to take a question here. Okay. Uh, show again how the noise appears when you go from a, from a discrete uh, equation to the... Oh, oh from, uh, from the discrete, you can't. Uh, no. From here yeah. to where the noise appears, it doesn't. Okay. There's no noise. There's no noise here. That's what I mean by the naive way of doing it. We're just putting it by hand and so on. You can go back to the master equation and get here by doing the so-called mean field. to get the deterministic part. to get the noise part. You have to look at the correlations. That's mine. <laughs> I should have turned it off. Uh, I was hoping that I would remember to turn it off. But um, all the other times I remember. So um, if you do the master equation and you look at the first moment, you make the approximation so that the average is on the the average of the property is the average you would get to here. Okay? Then, to get to the noise, you have to look at fluctuations so that you can make something before you get Okay? So, uh, to go from here to this equation is uh, not something that you would do, again, in a short time. It's not it's something that you would work at. So that's the thing you would hear, by the way. It's, you can do it. But, but there is an approximation. It, it's not exact. It, it, even though it's an approximation. Oh, not for the... Uh, but we can talk about even the resources at the end. Omega expansion and so on. It's <coughs> Okay, um, I would like to take uh, the next uh, little bit of time to cover a little bit of the flavor of what happens when you try to say, hey, there is more to biology than this simple little thing. And you remember seeing this picture, everything about this kind of busy analysis I learned from these ladies. And luckily they are here. And uh, so whatever I can't answer, I hope they would answer for me. So, tomorrow translation. Uh, the ribosomes, remember, start from the beginning of the meeting and go to the end. What Gibbs did was to introduce this one dimensional lattice, in which the site of these lattices is associated with a whole photon, not a single base. Because the idea is that the ribosome leaves a whole photon at once, and leads to the next one, and the next one. Codon is three base pairs. And the particle is supposed to be the ribosome. So that's what the picture is supposed to represent. Okay? So, so yeah, the extension. So, so, so sorry, when you go back to the picture, this one. But so the elongation stage is the RNA that's built. Oh yeah, the mRNA is sitting down here, which you can hardly see. No, but in the model, what's the elongation here? Oh, the elongation stands for the it's uh, hopping. The hopping in the middle is called elongation by the um, by the um, uh, biologist. So initiation is alpha coming on, the rate at which it comes. Elongation is just the rate at which it moves along. And gamma beta is when it takes off. Elongation doesn't mean stretch. Elongation, no, just, no, no, no. elongation is the stretching of the protein. So as you go along, the protein gets longer and longer. OK, many aspects of Taza, the S stands for simple, is not, is too simple. So I'm just going to focus on three in this, uh, the remaining. Uh, <laughs> okay. So one is that the ribosome is actually a very large molecule. Okay, and typically covers ten to twelve objects. So very much like Sid's lecture, instead of talking about the absorption of single particles, we are now starting off to talk about chambers, if you like, not just. One. And you, you remember from Sid's lectures already something non trivial shows up. So here, something interesting shows up. In particular, that fancy, nicely done, beta ansatz exact solution cannot be generalized. Nobody can solve it for L not equal to 1. So unlike six case, we can't do anything when L is not equal to 1. However, we can do simulations, and we can see that there is 
quite a bit of structure in this whole object. So there needed to be extended, say, extended objects covering L types, okay? And then the other two, which I'll try to talk about, is that we've been so far talking about jump rates, which are uniform. Bum, 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 bum. We want to talk about more than jump rates. And the last thing, if I ever, if I really have time, is to talk about what happens when you start to compete with each other these stuff. Now, let me come back to our extended objects. Actually, Gibson Company already had these guys back in 68 and 69. So, what do we mean? We mean that now the particles are no longer just little dots, but they are thick objects like this, okay? They cover it up with these codons. And we uh, define, or rather, we have defined that one of these sites to be called the meter, because this is the part of the microphone that actually leads the codon. So, think of it that way. This chosen arbitrarily at and then we can show that it doesn't matter where you choose it. The system's configurations, you know, the specified configurations, can be specified by saying where the readers are. That is zero or one. However, not all the odds are less. That's clear. Because if I is equal to one here, I cannot be equal to one here. I can't be one and two here. Right? So they're constraints. And it's these constraints that makes things very hard to solve. Exactly. Okay, so uh, let me see. Let me just show you a picture of uh, uh, the uh, original paper that goes on with that. Let me just say one thing. What did they do? They took these extended objects for an open chain and they tried to solve it numerically. In those days, they did it. They did it. They did it. It's so weak that they could do it in the other two. They try to make some approximations for J in order to go at it, and it's, um, it's um, not too bad. So let me just tell you about an interesting problem that is much easier than the original problem, <coughs> which is the simpler problem. And that is to take these extended objects and put it on ring, okay, with simple hopping, not the open one, the ring. It turns out that, again, with this uh, with this uh, pairwise detail balance, you can show that P star is equal to 1. That's what's not, that's not. And that the way you can see that this is the case is that no matter what configuration you take, you can always map it to the L for one case on a smaller ring, where every little particle you just uh, have, this, have, have uh, just this shrink it down to one guy, and the entire ring is a little bit less, and so on. Now, uh, there are many interesting aspects that happen already in this discussion, even though the distribution can be solved exactly, or is known exactly. One is that the number of holes and the number of particles no longer have one. So one of them is how many of the sites are being covered. Is one one right? And one is how many readers there are on the system. Needless to say, they're related to each other by just a type of L. Okay. The current density relationship, which used to be just rho times 1 minus rho, is now generalized to the reader density, the whole density divided by the sum. This is something you can also calculate explicitly from the P star equal to 1 situation. And Gibbs also had these. Here is a simulation and exact results, and that funny relationship. I'll see them right here for three different examples. So the two, five, and ten in these different times. If you take into account the exact value, this is the line that goes right through all the data points. And then here is this uh, these dotted lines is for the infinite system, which is this funny formula that I put in. You can see it's a place over at the different places and so on. So the current density relationship changes. There are some places where, they, where is the maximum, where is the max current, blah, blah, blah. It changes, and Leo is the one who has done this kind of simulation for, for us. More to the point is that even on this ring, remember, although I talk about exact mappings, you can still look at this ring and say, where are the particles? Where are the readers? You can still ask that. And you ask, start to ask yourself, what is the correlation between the two guys? Even though all the configurations are equally possible, this is not true. It's amusing, you can calculate it, and so on. I don't have the time to talk about it, so you have to go to JJ's poster. Okay, tomorrow evening. She will talk about it. Okay, let's go back to the open case. 
the open case where you don't have any solutions whatsoever, the first thing you have to decide is how you're going to put a particle on the system. And the way that we decide is to, you have to wait for L holes to exist before you can put somebody on. On the other hand, it doesn't have to wait for anybody, it just goes along because the last one is always a way you can let the case is not going to, to stop you from moving on. Right? And these people call it the complete entry and incremental exit, but uh, the physics doesn't depend on this kind of situation. So, this is what we do. Now the question is, what happens? Okay? And I'm going to jump. Oops. Sorry, let me see. Okay. So, I'm still jumping because we're going to cover a few other So, here's the uh, conclusion to the first extension. If you have these extended objects, what is going to happen? There will be non-trivial uh, correlations. When you have open, which is the one that I've described, nobody can solve what is going on. The phase diagram in J of O has a little bit of modification. Qualitatively, it's reasonably well understood. However, if you start to look in detail, there would be very strange results in the density profile. And those are, again, the things which hopefully J.J. Postman will show. In particular, they show new features that have very, very long tails. In the L for the 1 situation, there are, there are no tails to it whatsoever. They just the group it at the beginning and then it's just simple flat to the other hand. So these are the things that are already new that comes into the game. Let me briefly talk about the second extension. What is it, why is it that we don't want to just leave all the jump rates to be all uniform? And the answer is the following. There are 61 codons that codes for something. Three of them are codes for the beginning and the end. And then there are 61 um, TRNAs that correspond to them. And there are widely different concentrations. And if there are widely different concentrations, these were full ribosomes have to wait for it to come before it can go to the next step. Therefore, the waiting times implies that we should have jump rates that are gamma is now a function of the way we are. So we have inhomogeneous jump rates. Okay? And when you're inhomogeneous jump rates, not surprisingly, you can hardly solve anything. And this is why I call it plaza, where the standard particle in the jump rates and you have to stick it in a line here and a knee here, and you can call it tasty if you want. In any case, what really is the case is definitely not simple. Well, let me just show you uh, a little, uh, a few comments about what I think. So when we have inhomogeneous jump rates in the whole system, it reminds you of something in statistical physics called French random, you know, averages and average skin glass and things like that, where the interactions are different depending on where you are and so on. This problem of French randomness has been studied by Rosemary and Donald Robin, and then in 2004, in the, con in the following sense, every single jump rate is taken out of one distribution of either flat or uh, Gaussian, which is a normal thing that physicists would do. If you're going to make it random, I just pick it out of one distribution. Okay? Our case is much worse. Why? Because they are not the same. You don't the 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 uh, the the motivation. Okay. Our case is much worse because the crunch random average that you do in this case. What does crunch random average mean? You take a particular distribution of your rates. You ask what the current is. You take another distribution, you ask for the current is, and you ask for the overall current. Now in biology, we don't have random codes. Okay? If you have random codes coding for your body, you'll be in bad shape. <laughs> so it's not clear what French random is all about. Okay? Why, why we should have it. Indeed, we have a new type of problem, and what I call French distribution of distributions. Now let me just take a couple of minutes to explain that because this is something that we just mentioned very briefly in, uh, in, and it's not really in the literature anywhere. And that is the following. You remember that what we are trying to do is to make a protein, which is a particular string of amino acids. Okay? 
there are only 20 amino acids, but there are 61 products, which means on the average, every amino acid corresponds to three products. But that's the average. In reality, some amino acids have one codon, some amino acids have four codons, other amino acids can be coded by six codons. In other words, the randomness down here depends on what protein you want to make. So if you want to make the same protein, there are many ways you can choose this. Okay? So the distribution at each site is different. So nobody does spin glass this way, as far as I'm aware. Can you imagine picking an Eisen model where here you pick a bimodal distribution, over there you pick a Gaussian distribution, over there you insist on taking some other distribution of these shapes? No, nobody does that. That's what we have. So, we have a slightly more serious problem. And I obviously don't have time to tell you what all that is about. So, the full French randomness problem is too hard. So what do we do? We start simply. We start simply by taking one or two channels and make it equal to something different. If these jump rates are faster than the rest of them, it affects the density profiles, but it doesn't affect the J. If they're slow, it affects both of them. That should not surprise you, right? If you're driving cars and suddenly there's a spot, there's some cop is waving you on like crazy, all that would happen is a little bit something happens. But the jam is still the jam. But if there's a road construction in the middle of the road, we're going to stop the way up. What we find that is interesting is that it depends on whether these sun sites are together or apart, whether they're near the beginning or near the end. And that matters. And I don't know what it should be, we talk about that or not, but whatever. That's basically part of the thesis, so you should be able to ask. <laughs> okay? In any case, we have a qualitative understanding of how to get these results by taking pieces of these things and patching them across the inhomogeneity. But the real quantity of theory is still very much larger. Okay? So that's the situation of this. To recap the second extension, where we have inhomogeneous jump rates, the slow sites reduce the over current to increase slow sites. If they're far apart, it doesn't matter. If they're close together, they matter. And there could be implications for this uh, um, type of um, um, how, how to get the current to change by designing the regime. And we actually study with uh, some explicit examples. The main issue is how to deal with the problem of French distribution and distribution. Okay. Let me just now take one minute or two to talk about the third extension, which is typical cells have many copies of many types of these things. Uh, <coughs> many is typically a thousand or so, a thousand times of things. And they all use the same ribosomes and for that matter transfer on and the same form. So what happens if you have a finite reservoir of particles on one or more passage? So, um, who wins, who loses, we should study this. But to begin with this whole thing, let's ask, how does a finite resource affect a single passage? Okay? And this is done by uh, two of the students that are with us in the references for us. So, let me just give you a picture of what we're trying to do, and try to show you at least one thing that is somewhat surprising at the beginning, but not so surprising at the end when you think about it. Okay? So, instead of now the open path up where things just come in and go out, in this case, things when they get to the end just goes into the pool, and the pool is sitting here. The entry, on the other hand, sorry, going the wrong way, the entry here from the pool into here does depend on the number of particles, because if there are too few particles, you have to wait longer for it to come inside you. So, what we uh, are looking at is the number of particles on the plaza plus the number of the pool is a fixed quantity, so that's one constraint. The other one is that we've chosen an entry rate which has some alpha to begin with. This is the intrinsic on rate, the initiation rate, if it's applied to an unlimited. <coughs> don't care about it. So that's the original plaza. It's basically an entry system. Now, we've just chosen tangent particles because we like to think that at low, <coughs> low concentrations, 
this thing should be linear. This is going to take time to find the particles. So our low concentrations is linear, and our high concentrations is one, and this stands across is just some crossover length scale. Okay? All right. <coughs> now, what happens when you do this is the following. Let me just show you one picture to, as to what is happening. So remember that you could go into the high density phase there, set your alpha so that you're there, and now you start to constrain the total number of particles. If there are no particles, the on rate is zero, so you're down here. And as you change the total number of particles, you start to go up. And you're sitting in effectively the low density phase in the cross phase boundary when you come over here. How many particles are on the system is the question you want to ask. Well, there are three kinks instead of two. Well, how come there are two kinks per row, like that, and one kink for J, when you cross just one phase boundary? One phase boundary. You get two kinks. How come it doesn't just go up and you go to the other one? So it turns out that there's a very nice theory that you can use called the main law theory and so on, which again, um, ask me if you're really interested in how this whole thing works or read the article. But there's a much simpler explanation of why there are these two things that are going on. Remember the space diagram, right? And if there are too few particles, you can't possibly go anywhere, then you start in the bottom. You just crank up like this, and then suddenly you hit the phase boundary. And as you increase the number of particles, you are just going to go across to the other side linearly, and then when you get to the other side, you just stay there. So this should remind you of something. It should remind you that ordinary phase diagram for the PV goes like this. But if you're going to go across the phase boundary, it goes across here, cuts it off, and then go down. That's it. This is the simplest way of thinking about how this kind of thing happens. Now, um, let me just see if I can tell you a little bit more. If you don't go all the way to the uh, HD phase, but only go to the, to the shock phase, there are more interesting things that happen. There are two of these things instead. Let me just, uh, there are two crossovers. Hang on a second. Let me just jump to the end here. So that the, the color things is the simulations. The uh, other stuff is coming from the rain law theory, which you know, asks me more about it than you What is really amazing about this entire game is that this crossover, this second crossover, and it bends the other way and things like that, depends on the size of the system. This one is L to 1,000. Here's a case for L to 100. And the circles is the theory. It just goes right through it. And here's another theory, I didn't show the, the simulations. It just changes all the time just because of these giant fluctuations. So, um, you look at this slight deviation, you see that there are slight deviations, and these slight deviations seem so trivial, and you say, why in the world should I worry about it? It turns out that it's deceptively good, and another story emerges. Another story emerges has to do with the physics behind the whole thing, is that what are these uh, these fluctuations are pretty important, but they are really suppressed by this overall constraint. <coughs> this overall constraint can be understood in a very simple way. If you suddenly have more particles on the lattice, then with your larger end, there will prove be smaller and there will be smaller alpha to come in and it should make fewer particles. Then you should then localize the shock. The shock can't move wherever it wants anymore. As you have more particles, it says how uh, um, I can put more into the whole game, and so on and so forth. And let me just show you the profile of the shock once it's localized, if we generalize the domain more theory. The old domain more theory that gave me slightly different things gives you that as the profile. If you look at the area under the curve, which the total density, they look essentially the same. And that's why it is deceptively good. It seems to be very good, but it's really no good and so on. So I see that time is really very far gone, so I'm just going to try it again by uh, saying that, oops, no, we say. Recap of the third extension. Finite resources provide many, many interesting issues. Some are understood, and there are many problems that remain in particular that 
um, power spectrum goes slightly bananas, and that's why we're still trying to understand. So, you can do other things, extend protocols on constraints, on you know, popular rates, and then you can go to multi species, multi lanes, what have you, and a long, long way to go just to do one cell, let alone many cells for this and living being. So, the recap, I'll try to tell you a little bit about how that and how it might be related to things. And so, that's the um, um, content of this lecture. And we will try to then go and talk about more fun things on the next lecture. Thank you. Okay, questions? I've got 10 minutes already. I'm still scanning for him. Yeah, that's speechless. What can I say? The presentation is just there, obviously. Well, we're just flying over and we're just looking at the landscape. That's all we're doing. There was one statement earlier I think you said about the planet. Just what? <laughs> oh, I know, very good, Yes, there was one of them among many others. Um, we got the planet side effects, but we see a response to a different question from the power spectrum. Uh -huh. How come only one of the first we saw the planet side effects and we did it and we were just picked The other one is just pure random work. So pure random work is a clear about whether you have Remember this is in time, not in space. So um, the in pure animal there are no correlations, right? Mm -hmm. In the in the nice current phase there are non-trivial correlations. So there's actually a um, skinning function of length and time. So in pure animal there's no there's no itch going. And so the size of the system comes out. Um, let me just say that um, because of trying to surprise you with various things, I did not reproduce a number of my transparencies, and uh, they are here now. Mm -hmm. And uh, the supplements for yesterday's surprises should also be floating around somewhere. So if you want to have the transparencies of some of the things that I talked about that I didn't head out of your, your uh, notes there, I think you must be go out. Okay, so we still have time for more questions. Um, yeah, that's not a very open sort of question. Um, a lot of the phenomena are very um, uh, dependent on this traffic jam sort of 1D lane cannot pass. Um, how much have people studied, I mean, two lane models or lobby of occupancy? How generic are the results that we have? Well, um, a very open. Well, uh, tomorrow, I'm going to, is it tomorrow? Yeah, tomorrow I'm going to start talking about two species, which is a little bit more realistic for traffic because they're cost of shocks, okay? And then something really interesting happens to traffic. And so um, what we really would like to do, which we don't have time to do, is to ask whether anything interesting happens to 13 lanes, which is the motor transport issue. So, um, I'm not aware of any studies of three lanes even, let alone 13. But uh, that was another surprise which I can tell you about now, which is that in the Ising model, if you go from one line to two lines, nothing happens. Uh, here, when you go from one line to two lines, something major happens. So, that's more surprises that we don't really understand. So, if you went to the restriction of single occupancy, it could be double occupancy, that might not be so dramatic. Uh, that's correct. That, that we think is correct. Well, actually, double may not be that surprising. We will be infinite. If you're infinite, then if you have no restrictions, then it will be correct. Uh, I should tell you guys, by the way, that this is by no means the only um, um, uh, transport model, model of the study at one dimension. The other one is called the dual range process in which the occupancy at each site is unlimited. But uh, the rate of 
moving targets <coughs> on the other side depends only on how many guys are on that side. So it's like buttons, uh, taking a good number of uh, people from stocks and the number of people at certain stocks are unlimited and some hop on, some hop off and goes to the next stock and so on and so forth. That's called the zero rating process. And that one has space conditions that are um, similar to those on its own condensation, but it's a very different kind of space. So many, many, many things to do and many things to study. Okay? That's a long story. That's a long story. But in general, it doesn't get to very far. What was the question? How the density matrix is not very you know, you the density, density matrix. You mean all the detection groups, right? Density matrix, you know, detection groups. I don't mean density matrix. But in general, it doesn't get to very far. Okay. Very good. Uh, before you run out of coffee, can I please ask Ria, Thierry, Alexandra, Kieran?